Good afternoon and welcome to the Ocean Future Society Virtual Film Festival Live Q&A event for Swains Island, one of the last jewels of the planet. My name is Jim Knowlton. I'll be your host today. Thank you so much for attending. The Ocean Future Society Virtual Film Festival is a new platform where you can see classic Ocean Future Society films like Keiko Born to be Wild, Keiko The Gate to Freedom, My Father the Captain, Jacques-Yves Cousteau, and Swain's Island, one of the last jewels of the planet. We're very pleased to be able to present these films on an on-demand basis with this new technology and also to invite previous uh, scientists and filmmakers that uh, went into these projects on Zoom through conferencing to have these live events to talk about the films. Today's guests include Jean-Michel Cousteau, president of Ocean Future Society and the executive producer for Swain's Island, one of the last jewels of the planet. We also have David Jennings, one of the owners of Swain's Island and also Hans von Tilburg, the Maritime Heritage Coordinator for the Pacific Island region. And also he was the leader of the scientists that went to Swain's Island. A bit about Swain's Island, it's a tiny island, less than a mile across. It's located 200 miles north of American Samoa in the Pacific Ocean. It's reachable only by boat after a 26, uh, 26 hour ride. And when you get there, you sleep in a tent on shore. When uh, Swains Island was added to the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries wanted to have a survey of the island done. And so they put together this uh, expedition that took several years in the making to go to Swains Island to survey the cultural resources and biological resources to know what to protect for future generations. So I was very fortunate to be able to jump on the boat and go to Swains Island and to film Jean-Michel on the coral reefs and in the central lagoon on the island and also to follow the scientists as they did their work. And when we returned, we made this film with the help of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. Many people deserve a lot of credit. Uh, a couple, uh, a shout out to Dan Basta, the former director of the National Marine Sanctuary and to Jean Brighouse, a uh, senior policy analyst in American Samoa for their help to get all of this together and the work to be done. So before I bring on uh, our guests, I thought it'd be nice to play a clip from the show to kick off uh, this, discussion because it kind of sets the tone for the show and also the uh, the island. It's a small remote Pacific island located 200 miles north of American Samoa. Early Polynesian voyagers settled here and it was an important resting point to reach distant islands. It became a family-owned copra plantation that lasted for over a hundred years. There's a lake in the middle, and it's surrounded by pristine coral reefs. This new National Marine Sanctuary has never been surveyed to discover what traces might remain of its past. Join Jean-Michel Cousteau and a team of scientists as they explore Swain's Island, one of the last jewels of the planet. So I'd like to bring Jean-Michel Cousteau on. Jean-Michel, I've just invited your camera to be turned on. If you wanna turn that on and join us. Yeah. Uh, where am I? Just uh, where it says, do you want to start your video? Stop the video? Yep. Hey, there we go. Ah, <laughs> well, 
I want to say that for me, that has been a, one of the most exciting adventure that I have to be part of. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, Dan Basta, who had the idea. I say, maybe Jean Michel, you want to go there. And people always ask me, uh, why do you want to go there? Why is it just a little island in the middle of nowhere? And I say, I'm excited. Uh, every time I go to a place which I have never seen, I'm excited. And uh, to go to an island I've never seen after 75 years of scuba diving, I was like a kid. And uh, I, I just, I'm excited. And I met people, I didn't know how much these people could share and uh, finding out both the owners of that place, the scientific side of it, and what uh, uh, the government ultimately has done. Uh, for me, it was my favorite place to go. And I'm so glad. And uh, of course, I went out there to go diving. And maybe we can do a little short show uh, about Swain Dive. Could you do that, Jim, please? You bet. And, and amazingly, Jean Michel, that you know, both of us, what we said after that trip was like, I want to go back. I want to go back. Because <laughs> what an amazing opportunity that was. So let me find a clip for us here. Swain's Island is surrounded by a fringing reef that protects the island and the inner reef flats. Outside the fringing reef, the densely cold covered slope drops off quickly to deeper water. A curious school of blue trevally jacks greets me on my first dive on Swain's Island. A long white tip reef shark patrols the edge of the reef that seems to drop off quickly with no end in sight. Large pristine clusters of plate corals stretch out like tables on the reef wall at 60 to 80 feet deep. The clarity of the water is breathtaking and the visibility is hundreds of feet. The reef wall is completely covered with different species of healthy corals, each competing for space. Well, I want to go back there. And we've done three dives, but I want to do many more. And, and you commented in the show how each dive was different than the next in different terrains, different species composition of corals and, and different fish. And uh, it was really diverse on the three different corners of the island that we chose to dive on. That's right. So it's very exciting. And uh, I was so glad to be there and I want to go back. <laughs> I agree. I think it's a, it's a great time to welcome David Jennings who is one of the owners of the island. I think uh, to do that, let me, let me share a piece of the video, uh, a piece of the film with David, who I, uh, I sat down with David in, um, while I was there to do an interview and he's a master storyteller. And he, told, he tells the story of Swain's Island so well that uh, let's start off with a video of David Jennings. You know, I always say that um, I think if my great-great-grandfather came back today, he will find the island relatively in the same way that he found it. You know, there are some different buildings, but all in all, the landscape is still the same. The village locations are still the same. And uh, the reef is still the same.
from my great-grandfather. We do have the church that has survived numerous hurricanes and uh, a couple of tidal waves. Our family residence uh, now is, is still there, but it is in, it's in pretty bad shape, um, having weathered the, the years. And that's about the only remaining structures left. We do find remnants of what used to be. The other day I was pleasantly surprised by the discovery of a chimney there near the lagoon or the Namu that we used to dry copra. So finding these things like that, especially something that I knew nothing about, it's kind of like uh, I'm able to touch the past and connect with my ancestors. So let's welcome David Jennings. Hello. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jean-Michel. Let, uh, let me bring your video up here a little better. There we go. Welcome, David. So when we, uh, after we finished our 26 hour boat ride and were shuttled ashore and the inflatables and you had already been there for a month setting up that camp with probably, I don't know, a dozen tents and a, you know, a mess hall. And, and you had done such a great job and you were such a welcoming character. So can you tell us a bit about, um, about Swains Island? Well, first of all, I wanna thank you for uh, having me here once again and to join up with you, with you gentlemen. Uh, it was certainly, that time was a, an exciting and privilege for me to be part of this. I mean, the fact, yes, that, uh, uh, you know, our family has been there, our, and the Swains Island people have been there for, you know, a little over 100 years, but, you know, to finally have the opportunity to join up with such talent as yourself as a filmmaker and Jean-Michel as uh, an oceanographer who has been around the world and knows these things about, you know, the landscape, the shoreline and things of that sort. And then, of course, when we have Hans on here, but I think it's such a wonderful opportunity. It was, it was, a, it was a wonderful opportunity to be part of, of something that is able to tell the story of not just the Jennings family, but our people, our island, our culture, our landscape. And it's, it's such a beautiful story that, you know, that had not been told in such a long time or there was no means of telling it. And, uh, you know, being out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, 200 miles away from uh, the nearest land, if you will, uh, sometimes you can get forgotten. And this is such a wonderful opportunity to once again join up with you guys that were, made, that were able to make that possible. Uh, Swains Island almost tells its own story in your film uh, in the many ways that you approached it. And it was just a uh, exciting and privileged to be a part of it. And uh, there's so many people I know that I would like to acknowledge that made it possible, but certainly starting with you folks. Thank you, David. Uh, I hope that uh, everybody has a chance to see Swain's Island, one of the last jewels of the planet. We're, we're not going to play uh, too many parts of it so that we'll hopefully get you to go there, but. When you hear David tell the story of the Swains Islanders and the culture, it, uh, I mean, Swains Island was really a scientific trip, but in the science, as we are gonna talk in a few moments with Hans, is there's a lot of amazing discoveries and the cultural significance of Swains Island is very relevant. But, but David's stories about the Swains Islanders will tug at your heart and uh, it, was, it was very well done. So good job on that, David. Thank you. You bet. So with that, uh, I'd like to play a quick clip of Hans von Tilburg, and uh, we'll introduce him in just a moment. This is live. That's the way it goes. <laughs> Hans von Tilburg is a maritime archaeologist with NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries 
Maritime Heritage Program, and he's the leader of NOAA's team of scientists on Swains Island. Hans will work with each of the scientists as they report their daily findings in their respective fields. He and his team of scientists are here to learn as much about the island as possible. Swains Island, as part of American Samoa, is a very special place because Samoa, along with Fiji and Tonga, are understood now as the heartland of the development of Polynesian cultural traits. Fiji Tonga Samoa area is where the early voyaging migrations thousands of years ago came from the east. And I have to say that the settlement of the Pacific is the boldest human migration, certainly the boldest and, and largest marine migration in human history. I think it's fortunate that Swains Island has recently become part of the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. And so Swains Island becoming part of that system hopefully grants it recognition, rightfully due, as a special location, one to be considered and protected and preserved for future generations. And so that's actually what brings my team out here we want to know what are the special elements of its cultural past that lend it significance and need to be considered in the future. And as people come to understand and visit and enjoy these special places, what do we really need to be careful about and really need to preserve for future generations? I'm gonna welcome Hans on. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you, Hans. Let me turn my video back on, sorry. <laughs> and, and I will, you know, echo the, 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 the folks on the, the live broadcast here as well, my friends, in saying that it really was a special uh, opportunity for me to go someplace as a historian and archaeologist that hasn't had that kind of research or survey done ever before. It really was a glimpse to see, you know, what the island itself can tell us about its history. Uh, really enjoyable as well. Well, say thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot in a very short time, and I want to do it again. <laughs> I think everybody involved. Let's do it. Go back. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. <laughs> and, and, and I learned so much from you, Hans. Uh, especially related to Polynesian migration and how Swains being located 200 miles away from American Samoa just might have been a stopover to where humans migrated out of Taiwan and Fiji and Polynesia out to the Polynesian Triangle? Well, I, th I think most assuredly it, it was, and that is, you know, the, the boldest marine migration ever. And, you know, as we understand the, the Lapita theory and the migration eastward into the Pacific, you know, with uh, the Samoan islands being settled some 3,000 years ago, we know the Tokelau atolls were settled, you know, some thousand years ago, or maybe even a little earlier. A location like Swains with a freshwater lens would be a really important place to know about to go for the fish and for the water for resources, so surely it was that as well. And that was one of our um, goals to look for the early traces, the pre-Western contact, pre-1850 of what life was on Swains. And there are some features there that may be associated with that, like the, the Fale Foundation, you know, the House Foundation, uh, the mounds for the tarot patches and the enigmatic tupua, which you see in the film. But uh, the, the terrestrial archaeology work, we did not find carbon remains, which are datable. So we were not able to pin a date to those features. And there's a reason to go back and look into that early history. Yeah, I agree. There's, there it is again, a reason to go back. 
<laughs> we we also have week is, Oh, go ahead, David. No, I don't think one week is enough because that's yeah. all you had. Yeah. Yeah. We need yeah, one we year. <laughs> we would love to stay longer. And so, you know, Hans, you, you just mentioned the lagoon and um, we haven't really talked about that the fact that Swains Island has a central lagoon that takes up about a third of its surface area that is like 99% pure fresh water, which natural lakes in the world are, are unique and rare. Natural lakes on Pacific islands are like unheard of. That's an amazing, amazing resource. And that was, you know, a central part to our investigation and something that John Shell helped us to figure out as well, because we were able to confirm that at some point in the past, that interior lagoon, like many atolls, was open to the ocean, open to the marine environment. And at some point it closed. And as David knows, there's even an oral tradition in the family of knowledge of that open and closed status of that lagoon. When did that happen and how did it happen? Those were some reasons we brought a geomorphologist along with us, Rhonda Suka. And, um, you know, it's quite fascinating what she found and we're able to understand it better with a range of dates of when that event happened. And then the final focus of our research, and we knew we were going to find cultural footprints of, of this, is the 19th century period, the Copra Plantation period initiated by Eli Jennings Sr beginning about 1849, 1850. And um, that was the most productive for us in terms of historic properties discovered on the island. Many American and British uh, tools and items that tell a story of self-sufficiency. If you're going to go to Swains in 1850, you're going to need to bring everything you need yourself to survive. So we had a very strong story to tell that looks back about 150 years um, of what life was like there. And, and all of those aspects of our research are included in the report of the, the research expedition, which was published later uh, and is highly illustrated and includes the data and the findings of the archeologists and the geomorphology work, et cetera. I think you have an image of the report yeah. You, let me look for that just a moment. Yeah. As a you publication know. from the Sanctuaries program, it's of course available free online. Uh, you're okay, Jim? Yeah, just digging it up here in our live broadcasts, full of magic. Okay, so here's the cover. Yeah. Yeah, lots of pictures, lots of data, and it explains, you know, how we did what we did on the island. Um, it is the first time something like this has been put together for a very unique location, Swains Island. Do you want to we we have go through a few slides, Hans? Yeah, yeah, we have some images that help show examples of the findings. Uh, this is very special. This is a result of our side scan sonar survey in the lagoon. You can see the central lagoon itself, the enclosed lagoon now, and the number of side scan sonar targets we found looking for historic or earlier features, cultural features in the lagoon. We weren't able to confirm many of those because of the existence of the mats of cyanobacteria, the, the blue-green algae, which exist there and made diving very difficult. But you know, this is a, an unseen image. Only now can we see the bottom features of the interior enclosed lagoon. Next image. Here's an example of the things we found with the sonar. You can see uh, on the right hand side, there's a feature that projects above the sediment, above the blue green algae, and has some linearity to it. It's casting a shadow from the acoustic sonar. Um, but in this case, like many others, this proved to be a tree trunk that had fallen into the lagoon and not a structural piece or timber or anything like that. It's emerging above the, the, the mats of algae. Next image. 
about the channel on the south side, uh, Rhonda did sampling of the coral deposits found on the exposed swale and also coral from the interior of the lagoon. And this shows the swale areas as covered in the, the film where the debris from the ocean coral reef was pushed up by very severe storm events onto the channel area, closing the original channel into the lagoon. The swales, the open coral areas are still there. And the interesting thing is uh, we were able to date the coral in the swale area using thorium dating techniques back in the lab. And um, the, the most uh, recent uh, coral deposit on land where the channel used to be sometime between about 1600 and 1700 AD, so several hundred years ago. And that may be when the transition was closing the channel. But we also took samples of coral inside the lagoon. And what that told us is we know there's living coral in the lagoon at least as late as 645 AD, much, much longer ago. So certainly the lagoon was open, but at some point no later than uh, 16, 1700, that, that channel was probably closed. Next image. Uh, and then there are the historic features from the, the plantation period, the Eli Jennings senior period. And these really do um, show, you know, what he needed, what life was like from 1850 on. This happens to be really this is the way we figure out what they are. When you find little uh, plaques and inscriptions on historic properties like this, we're looking at a copper life buoy, a life ring that's made out of copper, actually, from the Bath Iron Works in Bath, Maine, the Franklin life buoy. And that's probably 1888. And uh, certainly a life-saving device you would wa have wanted if he's in small boats outside the channel in the open ocean. This is actually one of my favorites. This is a, a small emblem on the door to the iron stove at the residency. So this is Eli Jennings Sr.'s kitchen stove, which was apart from the main house. And when you look at it closely, you can see it says Cairn Company. Uh, that's an ironworks in Scotland named after the Cairn River. And in the middle, you can make out the crossed cannons because the Cairn Company were the ones that innovated small cannon called carronades, which played such a role in maritime history. But they also built uh, ovens and stoves for kitchens. And Scotland is where Eli Jennings Sr. found his stove and imported it all the way to Tiny Swains. Thank you, Hans. Yeah. You know, the, uh, all of the science was fascinating on Swains. And each of the scientists with different varieties of specialties, each worked as hard as they could within the seven days they had to discover as many things as they could. And, and it is really fascinating to see all of it. And, and yet the, uh, the Rhonda Suka story with the closure of the lagoon, as she walks you through in the film, you discover through her eyes this deposit of sharp coral far from shore that could only have been thrown there in a large event, according to her. And, and you see this sharp coral that is we supposedly radiocarbon dated 500 years old or older, and, and yet it's uneroded like the rest of the coral deposits near shore. And uh, I urge you all to take a look at the film because it's a really cool segment how she walks us through that. Uh, potential uh, theory. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wonderful. It, it's the island telling us directly about its past and about that channel that used to be there. And she has more of a connection to Swains than just going there and doing research, right, David? That's right. She's just uh, also related by marriage. Her husband is a is a cousin of ours. <clears throat> What's interesting about the the coral? You know, I, I've walked over that so many times from when I was young to, you know, older and up until the time that you guys came out and did your, your study. I never thought of that. I never thought 
how that that coral played a part or or what that evidence what that evidence was saying you know about the lagoon there was there was been uh, you know talk and stories in our family that the lagoon was open at one time and we've even thought well what would it be nice to be for it to be open again but uh <clears throat> but it's always been you know mentioned and spoken that the, the lagoon was open at one time but never know when and that yet here we are walking over that evidence all that time to prove that, that it was open. And it's, it's just amazing how uh, Hans and his team was able to decipher all that. Yeah. Yeah, really cool. You wanna show a couple more images, Hans, uh, of historical uh, art, uh, artifacts? Yeah, we know a bit more about uh, life on the plantation period and, and Eli Jennings Sr. Here you can see in a satellite image the location of the historic features that we discovered on the island as well as around the perimeter of the interior enclosed lagoon, places where there were pilings showing where the docks were to move Copra back and forth uh, to the main village rather than carrying it on the road. This just gives you an idea of the scale of, of the work involved and one week was pretty short. We'd love to go back and look further into that round, round the atoll road that's there somewhere and find more historic features. Next image. This is something we see actually very frequently on the shipwrecks of historic whalers in the Pacific and elsewhere from the 19th century. This is a grindstone, a grinding wheel, which would have been on the deck of the ship and kind of half submerged in water. And you put a crank through the middle of it and you keep the, the lances and the harpoons sharp. But if you're going to live out there on a remote island, you've got to keep all your tools sharp. You simply brought the whaler's grindstone onto the island and it's still there today. And it's still useful in sharpening tools, I understand. That's rather remarkable. Next image. And something we also actually find on the shipwrecks of historic whaling vessels, the iron tripod, the large tripods used to boil out the blubber, boil out the oil on the decks of these, these greasy, smelly, you know, whale factories back in the day is useful for a number of different purposes. So this is an, you know, kind of an old style, about 140, 150 gallon iron whalers tripod. Uh, we know we think there were two on the island. One is in a museum in Tutuila now, but the second is still on the island as water catchment and in, in pretty good shape. Next image. You no, know, about that. <clears throat> oh yeah, go ahead. That whale pot, you know, uh, my wife's mother, she remembers back in the uh, early you know, 1920s, I think it was. She remembers over there in that area that you're talking about with that coral we spoke of earlier, that's where they used to uh, melt or, or cook the, the, the whale fat up there in that area. Oh, okay, okay. Pretty useful implement and they, they last a long time. So we do find them sometimes on islands, lots of times on shipwreck sites. This is interesting. I wasn't sure what this was at first. Uh, this is a ship tank. This comes from London. And from the 1870s onwards, wooden barrels had been the preeminent transportation container back in the days of, of old wooden sailing ships. But, uh, you know, wooden barrels, fairly limited, don't last very long in the archaeological setting. But the ship tank, the galvanized iron tank like this, a waterproof tank, started to take the place of those wooden barrels, 1870s and onwards. And there are several of these on the island. Not only could they be used to contain water, fresh water, but you could load food or provisions into them. And uh, you could even, if it would float, throw it into the ocean and float those provisions ashore. And once ashore, the, the box, the tank itself is very useful. From Byron Tank Works, 200 gallon ship tank, 
from London, now on Swains. And, uh, you know, something else that obviously doesn't deteriorate very quickly. Uh, Eli Jennings Sr. was also a blacksmith. He was a, a shipwright, a whaler, you know, a man of many talents. And, you know, you have to be kind of a uh, master of all trades to survive in the 1850s in the Pacific and anvil. There are no markings on this, this blacksmith's anvil, but in style, it's very closely related to the, the Peter Wright anvil in English design, circa 1862. And so we know that uh, Jennings Sr. arrived about 1849, 1850. Um, so something like this could have come along very soon. This would have been his anvil for blacksmithing on the island. So that's remarkable. And this took us a little while to figure out, but you can see the, the, the hand cranked and foot operated gears for this metal table with, all, with, with a slot in the middle. It is a human powered hand and foot powered table saw. Not something that, that carpenters would wanna use these days, <laughs> but you can't plug in anything for electricity in 1850. So to be self-sufficient on the island, uh, you look for table saws like this from the Barnes Company in Rockford, Illinois. And this model is, uh, shows up about 1895, sometimes between 1895 and 1928. He would have imported a table saw like this, quite useful for his needs. So just a glimpse into some of the features that tell some of the story of that, that plantation period. Really great stuff. Thank you, Hans. That's really informative. And uh, if people would like to see those images and read the report, Ocean Future Society has posted a link on its webpage at oceanfutures.org in the blog section. And you have a direct link to that free report that uh, lists the findings of the survey at Swains Island. Right, thanks for doing that, Jim. Yeah, you bet. Hopefully uh, people learn more about Swains and, uh, and take advantage of that survey. So I'd like to uh, swing back to Jean-Michel because he and I spent a whole lot of time in that lake and uh, the lake is, <laughs> is actually a lagoon, I'm told, even though uh, uh, it, I call it a lake, but Let's play a video from our time in the lagoon. Our team has heard stories that the lake may have once been a saltwater lagoon open to the sea. Though, if this is true, it's thought that this would have been hundreds of years ago. We look forward to exploring the lake to search for clues about its history. Are there any species that were once saltwater species that have adapted to living in freshwater? Could the lake be hiding artifacts lost or hidden by Polynesian voyageurs hundreds or thousands of years ago? What other secrets might we find in this mysterious lake? I can't wait to explore. The bottom of the lake has small rocks and some algae growing. Visibility is not surprisingly poor. When I stop swimming, I'm greeted by small fish that are attracted to me rather than swim away from me. The longer I stay in one place, the more of these bold little fish seem to arrive. They look like a species of flathead goby, a freshwater fish species that is common in habitats like this. Their larvae can probably traverse salt water when they disperse. So it's very possible that these fish arrive to Swain's Island without any human help. Well, it's nonstop. 
uh, <laughs> I can go back there because every time we had the opportunity of getting into the lake, I was looking and finding things that are totally different. Uh, and that's why I'm so excited uh, to think about going back and uh, not only diving all the way around the island, because I feel frustrated not to have been able to do that as much as I wanted to. But in the lake, uh, there's a lot to be done. And I'd love to show you the what we call, we call it the cocoa puffs. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And that's Jim is playing with it. Much of the lake bottom is covered with small pieces of orange, yellow, and green colored pieces of algae. They are floating loosely on the bottom, and if you run your hands through them, they are easily moved and they sink back down to the bottom. The NOAA scientists studying the lake during the expedition found that the bits of algae that they nicknamed cocoa puffs are as deep as 16 feet in some areas. Jim also finds a historic brass artifact on the bottom, probably a remnant of the Cobra era when workers rode across the lake. Near the Palm Tree Island, the lake bottom drops off quickly and the ledges look like they could once have been a coral reef. There are many white clam shells that are a saltwater species, a strong indicator that this lake was once a saltwater lagoon. We also find pieces of limestone that once cleared of algae and debris look very much like the remnants of corals. These samples lead me to believe this area was once a saltwater lagoon. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's exciting and uh, thank you to uh, David Jennings to uh, uh, have us uh, so welcome to that place. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure David, uh, Dave, you have things to share with us. Well, we certainly, uh, like I said earlier, we certainly just were impressed with the whole undertaking. And uh, we certainly would like to do this again. Uh, we, are, uh, we are trying to set up things where we're able to make more expeditions possible to do research uh, on Swains. That I, th I do think there's more to be said, there's more to be discovered. Uh, and I, as I said earlier, I don't think a week is enough. I think, uh, and I think we even bring other uh, pieces of technology that may reveal more than what we were able to find on the lagoon. Because as I even said in the movie, there are things that even as a, uh, you know, as a person of Swains that I don't, I didn't even know. Some of the things that Hans just revealed now uh, were, were very informative to me. So I'm hoping that we can like do this once again, uh, certainly with, uh, Ocean Futures and, and Jim making another documentary, that would be really nice. But uh, <laughs> that would be exciting to have Hans and his team come back to and do more research. And uh, we're looking forward to do more expeditions. Well, I, I hate to say it, but we may have to go diving back into that, that cyanobacteria, that, that algae in the lagoon. We had nightmares about that, Dave. Uh, it was not an easy week. We we use the side scan sonar, a high frequency acoustic tool, so we could even sense into that algae layer, this cyanobacteria that is able to photosynthesize, and get a return. So we could see targets that may have been cultural items, but then when we dropped on the spot, you know, we just get to the bottom layer of the algae. So we were we were penetrating that that layer, but unable to confirm 
the the identity of those possible properties, those historic properties. So um, <laughs> we may end up back in there. Well, for me, this is a perfect example of what we need to do. We need to protect ocean places, which uh, have been ignored for most people. And today we all connected to each other through the water system with the communication system that we have. And I really look forward to being able to learn more. Uh, you know, Swain Islands is a little island in the middle of the Pacific, which uh, nobody could report about in the past. Today, it's one of the jewels that we need to make sure is being protected. And thanks to the National Marine Sanctuary uh, Foundation, uh, we are able to continue doing this and uh, to make sure that we can share uh, thanks to scientists, thanks to the owners, the family, and uh, being able to show that to the rest of the planet and the people who care and want to make uh, what needs to be done to protect our place. If you protect the ocean, you protect yourself. Well said. And I think Swain's Island is a good, uh, is a good litmus test of what, if we don't take care of things, if we like, we don't take care of a place like Swain's Island, that how uh, outside things can impact uh, that it could, you know, diminish either it's either it's beauty, either it's uh, uh, well the cultural things that have already gone gone you know to the past. But I think it's a it, it's a indicator of how we should take care of places. It's should, how we should take care of our our oceans, our shorelines, and uh, you know our family has been has been committed to that uh, throughout our history that we preserve what we have there. And we would like to you know, do things that would encourage that. And that's one of the reasons why our family got involved with doing this to encourage the preservation of, of not only our place, but other places that are similar, that we see that you know, modern times have, have diminished with either use or abuse, whatever the case may be. So, uh, it was a, it was a joy to be part of this. Well, thank you, Dave, for having us. Uh, thank you to your family and your team. Thank you, Hans, for being learning like I've learned a lot, which I didn't know anything about. Thanks to Dan Basta for having the idea of making us go out there. And uh, I think there's huge to be done and I'm looking forward to it. And I want to share it with other people uh, to continue to celebrate my 75 years of scuba diving. Well, I also said. want to thank my brother, Alex. My brother, Alex, he is the representative in Samoa. He has been holding the fort there for years now. But I want to thank him also, because he, he helped spearhead this, this coordination with Dan and, and bringing together Swains Island with the National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, it, it, it would not have been possible without those two working together to, to do it. So uh, my, my brother uh, deserves a lot of credit for making that happen. Yep, thanks, Alex. Uh, before we go to the q and I just wanted to share one more image. And that is David and I traveling to Sarasota, Florida, as part of the Blue Ocean Film Festival, where the Swains Island film was in a category that it won top award in cultural connections, people in the sea. And uh, we received that award and we are very honored to accept it on behalf of the village of people it took to make this film and to make it happen. That was truly a, a wonderful experience and an honor to have this film receive an award. And with that, and, and that, that was really fun, David. That was a, that was such was. a uh, to be to share that with you. Well, you know the story. One 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 uh, antidote from that story. Um, 
was I wasn't prepared actually for that trip. I went over there with just a pants and a shirt. And when we went to get the award, I didn't have a jacket. So I had to borrow <laughs> a jacket from Jim. <laughs> Who had two. <laughs> Who had two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, happens. <laughs> that was a night to remember. So we, uh, I, we knew we would have so much material here and we really only scratched the surface. Honestly, we could have had any one of the other people or scientists on this, on this presentation and all of them could have presented work and we had hoped to keep it to a half an hour so that we could do some Q and A. And uh, at this point, I'm gonna see if I can switch gears here and get some of the questions in, in our short remaining time. Uh, before I begin, let's see, I, I did take some notes a little bit along the way. And uh, from the people who did answer my question, where are you at today? We have New York, American Samoa, Brazil, Michigan, Wisconsin, Santa Maria, Montana, Santa Barbara, and I'm sure a lot more. Uh, so people are enjoying this across the globe through this new wonderful technology. Thank you all for attending. And I did see a question here a moment ago. And if you have questions, please feel free to type them in. Now, as many questions that uh, we are not able to uh, deal with right now, uh, they can send it to us, and uh, I want to know, and we'll do everything we can to reply. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so someone was asking about the coral reefs and whether they had been mapped as part of a certain program, and I'm just looking for that question now. Because there's a long list of people saying hello. Um, it's probably, um, I, I think maybe you know, Hans, that, that Swain's Island is part of a monitoring program. And I forget the name of it, but basically they do put uh, pins in coral reefs with plates and then they uh, measure the amount of growth and they do that throughout the Pacific. Are you aware of that study at all? Right, yeah, the uh, you know fisheries service and others have, have been there and, and have looked at the coral reef in the past. And, have information and have ongoing studies. And there are transect pins in place so they can return and continue to monitor. What we saw was, you know, quite, quite healthy and abundant, no question about that. And there is an element of uh, biological research in the expedition we did, but it wasn't our focus. So we weren't mapping the coral reefs uh, per se. But yes, there's been a characterization of the health of the coral reefs and that information does exist. Yeah, this, the question actually now is, was, was Swain's Island mapped on the Allen Coral Atlas? Does that sound familiar? I believe it is, but yeah. you're talking to a historian and archaeologist, so I, know, I, know. I asked that one to my, my, my fisheries and biology friends. What, I think uh, Wendy Clover would know that. Oh yeah, and, and it would be neat to have another one of these with Wendy and Rhonda and others. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the diving, which we didn't do as much in this program on the coral reefs, at least showing it, there, there is a strange algae growing on the coral reefs, which we haven't touched on in this program, but is shown in the film. And um, I received an interesting email from Bill Keeney this morning, and he said, you know, there's a possibility that uh, the fresh water from the lake that does seem to seep out in a couple places in the ocean, maybe that's providing some extra nutrients on the coral reefs that feeds some of that algae. And we also noted a lack of grazers on the island, or at least a lower number, um, all beyond the scope of our, uh, our discussion, because none of us is the biological representative. But just wanted to mention that as, as uh, an interesting theory of where nutrients may be coming from. Right. It, it is odd to see algae like that, you know, in conjunction with the coral reef environment. Um, so that is odd. Yeah. And, and what we found is that the corals didn't seem to be suffering. No. They, they seem to be very healthy. And yet there was a larger amount of an encrusting algae. Uh, so interesting. That's why we have to go back. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, guys, I think we, uh, oh, no, actually, wait, we do have a few more minutes. So um, let me see if I can find another question. Lots of people are high-fiving each other and, and saying hello. And, and that is one of the really cool things about these is that uh, in this pandemic, COVID-19, this is a great way for colleagues and people to get back together. And, and through this festival, we've been finding so many of our friends and colleagues and, and scientists and filmmakers, you know, we were finding ways to get back together. And, uh, and, and this is one of the ways through this chat box and through our Zoom call. Mm -hmm. That's why, Jim, to me, uh, I'd love to get the questions from all those people who uh, we have not been able or we're not able to answer. But I want to know what their questions are, and we'll get back to them uh, with answers that are, that would be very helpful. Yeah, that's that's great, and we can all you can always tune back into this question and answer box because the questions continue or the uh, the question box continues to remain. Anyone who's watching this live event can ask questions there, even though we're not live. And we can answer you through that box going forward. OK. I just want to say very quickly, Jean-Michel, uh, I enjoyed our dive together outside the reef in the non-algae bacteria environment. And <laughs> I know you hear this you know, quite often, but I just want to remark and say, um, I started diving 50 years ago because of your family. And thank you for that. It's uh, a legacy it, uh, well known. It's, uh, it's not my fault. It's my father's fault. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> well, I'm glad you're doing it. Never stop. And you know, salt preserve. Salt water <laughs> preserve. Uh, Ken Pedro says he was born on Swains Island and he enjoyed the program and thanks us very much. Oh, great. Oh, great. Where is he? Uh, he didn't say. Interesting. He was born That's family. on Swains Island. Dave, you don't know? That, that would be family, yes. Family? Mm hmm That'd be great. <laughs> well, it's hard to read. It's hard. There's, there's hard to find these questions here, I'll be honest. So, um, I just will conclude by saying many thanks to everyone involved, to the three of you for taking part in this and uh, sharing your information with everybody. And on behalf of the Ocean Futures Virtual Film Festival, we hope you will all tune in to this film and the other films that are available on our website. And uh, we appreciate you showing up today and taking part in this uh, this presentation in our Q&A. Do you guys have a parting parting word? And um, soon we'll have more. <laughs> yes, we uh we are looking at, you know, ramping back up, making uh, these expedition uh, expedition opportunities uh, more frequent. And so, uh, you know, this pandemic has curtailed a lot of efforts in, in getting things done, as you may well know. But we're hoping that uh, we can have more expeditions like this in the near future. And uh, we'll be ramping up to do things of that sort, you know, whether it's for research or perhaps even just for folks who want to stay, go over there and take a look and visit. And uh, so, but thank you for having, having me here. I enjoyed meeting up with every one of you again. And there's so many people I said that we need that that we should thank, but I know the list is long and distinguished. But uh, as I want to thank uh, the National Marine Sanctuary for making this possible. Uh, Jean Michel, you and your company, uh, Hans, your scientific team, and Jim, you're such a talented filmmaker. Uh, just amazing piece of work, and uh, it was just a privilege for me to be a part of it. And I would also like to thank the Swains Island people that made our history and, and brought, you know, the culture and everything to, to Swains Island. And uh, 
but I appreciate this time to be with you folks. Very cool. Yes. Well, with that, that parting, parting word, Hans? Well, you know, there is always more to do, but I, I would say that everywhere that people have been and, and stayed, they've, they've shaped the environment and left a cultural footprint. And so Swain's Island has its own story to tell and it has more of a story to tell and there's a reason to go back. Uh, but its story is, is absolutely unique in the elements it brings together and, uh, and what it can tell us about ourselves. And it's a remarkable place. And of course, quite, quite beautiful. So it was a pleasure to go and be a part of this, this work. Wonderful. Thank you all. With that, we'll conclude our presentation. Everybody have a wonderful morning, afternoon or evening, depending upon where you're at. <laughs> Thank you. Signing Thanks, out everybody. Take care, everybody. <laughs>